So our next speaker was to be Cathy Tyers from Historic England. Um, <coughs> Cathy is a, a dendrochronologist and worked for Historic England for about 40 years. But unfortunately, because of personal reasons, Cathy couldn't get here today. But very kindly, Rebecca Lane has come over to read Cathy's talk. It's very kind of you, Rebecca. Uh, Kath, uh, Rebecca also <coughs> works for Historic England and something of a specialist in vernacular buildings, I understand. All right, over to uh, um, Rebecca. <laughs> So, as Lizzie said, um, my colleague Kathy Pies was meant to be speaking about um, Dendro today. Um, she is a dendrochronologist in our scientific dating team. I am not a scientist. <laughs> I am actually a senior architectural investigator for um, Historic England. Um, so, I spend my time researching and recording buildings, much like what Mary and, and Tony have been talking about today. Um, so I tend to sort of interact with Dendro in the same way that they, they do, which is to sort of get the dates from Cathy and then puzzle over why they don't correspond with the dates that you thought they were going to be. Um, and so I have a very kind of non-specialist, <laughs> non-scientific approach to this. Um, so I'm going to read Cathy's talk um, and apologies if I have to sort of rely quite heavily on what she's, what she's saying. Um, so she obviously wants to talk um, about dendro dating and the difficulties in Dunster. Um, so it's following on from the theme of Mary's talk, I think. Um, and basically, she's going to she's sort of going to use this talk to sort of give a very brief reminder of how dendrochronology works, um, and then how we sort of try and understand the results. Um, and then she's um, also giving a sort of general overview of the dendro program in Dunster and some of the problems that they encountered. So dendrochronology in the British Isles is founded on oak. Oak is by far the commonest timber used for structural elements and large artefacts throughout history and prehistory. Dendrochronology identifies when a tree was grown by looking at the variation in the amount of growth a tree puts on each year as recorded by the width of the annual growth rings. Uh, this generally reflects the climatic, the climatic conditions <laughs> that the tree was growing in, um, and it's that signal recorded in tree rings that's the key to successful dendro dating. Um, unfortunately, similarities are very, very rarely as obvious as the examples that they give here. Um, so in order to identify similarities in the patterns of wide and narrow rings, they record the width of each individual ring and then they use a statistical approach to identify similarities between the, re the ring sequ sequences in different timbers. Reference data or chronologies have been developed over the last 50 years or so and are still being added to whenever they analyse a new site. Reference chronologies now exist for the last 7,000 years um, but temporal and geographical coverage varies across the British Isles. The key piece of information required from dendro analysis is when the tree, when the tree a timber was derived from was actually felled, and hence when the, when the timber was used in the construction or the roof of the roof or a ceiling or a ship or another object. Oak, rather conveniently, consists of an inner heartwood and an outer sapwood, um, which I think is shown in the photographs on the left-hand side here. Um, so you can see on the bottom one, you've got the heartwood labelled um, as the inner core, and then you've got the sapwood, and then you've got bark edge um, just beyond that. Um, and actually, I was going to point out, as, as, as Tony did, as a very good example on the collar here, where you can actually see some of the bark edge surviving on, on, on timbers. So sometimes you do, get, you do get timbers that have still got that sort of final ring, that final, um, that final stage of growth on them. Um, so on the diagram here, um, each bar represents a sample obtained from an individual timber. 
In this example, the heartwood of a sample, so that's the inner part, is represented by the blue edge, white bar, blue edged white bar, and the sapwood is represented by the red edged grey bar. So where they've got the sapwood almost complete, with either the bark still attached or they're at the bark edge, then a felling date of a single precise year can be given, um, and potentially even the season, so they can say that it was felled in the spring or the autumn of that year, which is very satisfying, um, but rare. <laughs> um, where some sapwood has survived, but the bark edge has been lost during the sort of processing of the, the tree into the timber element, or sometimes subsequently due to sort of rot or damage when, when, when the sort of timber's been sitting in the roof structure. Um, they might be able to give a felling date range, so to say that the tree was felled between, between two dates, you know, a sort of period of 20 or 30 years perhaps. Um, the number of sapwood rings, so the, number, the outer part of the tree, is relatively constant. Um, so if part of the sapwood is missing, then they can estimate the number of rings lost to produce a felling date range. Where they've only got hardwood, so you've got no sapwood at all and no trace of it, um, it's possible to produce a date after which the tree was felled. Um, but that's, that can be very imprecise then. So you might be saying that um, you know, it, a, tr um, a timber was felled after 1450, but it could be 150 years later. It's not, it's not, much, not much precision from just hardwood. So moving on to the condenser. Um, this, this diagram shows the buildings that have been subject to dendroanalysis in Dunster. Um, 17 of these 18 buildings have had one or more timbers dated by dendro, the exception being the Stag's Head on West Street, um, which has only had one timber sampled in it, um, and unsurprisingly because it's just a single timber that didn't, couldn't be securely dated. With dated timbers, mostly from roofs, it appears that the Zendro programme has been very successful. However, all is not necessarily quite as it seems. Um, I think the sort of key context for this is that there have been really two phases to the Dendro in Dunster, um, which was um, an early um, phase done about sort of 15 years ago, Mary, was it sort of, um, with, with Time Team, um, which is the, the red dots that are shown here, which was a programme called Unearthing Dunster. Um, and then there's obviously been the, the later phase of the later phase of work, the most recent phase of work, done as part of the early Dunster project. Um, and then I think um, what was found was that really only one or two timbers from some of these buildings had previously been securely dated from the majority of the buildings analysed as part of the earlier project. Um, and this is far from ideal, particularly when considering the potential for the reuse of timbers or timbers or timbers inserted as part of the repairs or modifications to buildings within the areas. I think you know, Mary's, Mary and Tony's talks have really emphasised how much change happens to these buildings. And obviously, if you're just sampling you know, one or two timbers, you could easily light upon one that, that got put in 200 years after the rest of the roof. So you have to make sure that you're building up your samples to be confident about the, the, date, the date information that you're getting. While sampling was rather more limited in some buildings than would generally be recommended, it was clear that obtaining secure dates for samples had proven difficult with just over a third of the 70 samples taken as part of the earlier project having been dated. Um, so about 33%. This contrasts starkly with the 70 to 80% of suitable samples that are generally dated, equating to 90 to 95% of buildings analysed, having a series of dated timbers associated with them. So quite a low success rate in dating timbers in Dunster previously. Um, it's for this reason that during the early Dunster project, it was considered appropriate to carry out more extensive sampling on several of the buildings that have been analysed previously. Um, so I think you can see on this map that um, the red dots are the ones that were previously sampled, yellow dots are the ones that have been sampled for this programme, and the, ones red, the yellow ones with the red outline have been sampled by both. This 
illustrates the felling dates or felling date ranges, or in one case, a felled after, a date felled after, terminus post quem date, obtained for each building following the early Dunster Dendro programme. Where bark edge is present, the felling date given for a group of related timbers is precise to the year and possibly the season. Where a group of related timbers don't have bark edge, but at least do have some sapwood, a felling date range is given. This means that those related timbers were felled at the same time or similar, similar time as part of a single felling event at some point during the, the date range given. As we're in the process of finalising the dendro analysis, the felling date ranges illustrated are deliberately not labelled <laughs> with actual date ranges, as these may vary slightly once final reports are produced if any of the additional samples are dated during the sort of final sweep up, final processing of the entire data set. The four labelled dates are simply to flag up that timbers dated range from the 13th century right through to the later half of the 17th century. All but five of the, of the 18 buildings now have more than one or two dated timbers, so much more secure evidence base. Those buildings that were more extensively sampled during the most recent Dendro programme demonstrate the benefits of wider sampling strategies in places when Dendro has previously shown to be challenging. Some examples are given next. So the early Dunster Dendro program has resulted in a series of timbers from the old Priory South Range roof having been successfully dated, added, adding to the two that were dated as part of the previous project. With the dates of the Hartwood Sapwood boundary rings varying by only 13 years, it appears likely that the timbers represented were derived from trees felled at the same time or similar time as part of a single felling event. With a decent number of timbers dated from this roof, we can now say that the construction of this roof would have followed very shortly after this felling event, sometime in the 1450s to 1470s. The next important step with this date, as with all Dendro dates, is to put them in a wider context with respect to the historic development of the building, using the detailed structural evidence and the documentary evidence that Mary and her team have undertaken. These different strands of evidence are all pulled together to, to produce a more informed interpretation, thereby enhancing the understanding of the building. So the key thing is, you know, quite often dating the building, if you've got, especially if you've got a date that was different from what had been previously thought about building, you've really got to go back and interrogate the building and ask, you know, what it is that looked early, why it was thought to be early, you know, what it is that might help to prove the, the date range that you're given by Dendro. <laughs> I always think it raises more questions than it answers Dendro. <laughs> um, so moving on to Seven Church Street, um, Again, the samples from, so this, again, this is one that was, was sampled as part of the um, earlier project and then has been resampled for the current project. Um, and so that's added to those that have been previously dated. And what these newly dated timbers demonstrate, um, with a variation of 58 years in the Hartwood Sapwood boundary dates, is that these timbers represent more than one falling event, so more than one phase to the roof. The two identifiable falling events are some 30 years or so apart, the early one being in the late 13th or early 14th century, and the later one being in the 1330s. So you've got a restructure which, which may have gone up sort of, you know, around um, 1300, and then about 30 years later, there's been extensive alteration. Although, actually, it goes on to say, in this instance, it's not obvious from the dendro whether the earlier felling date indicates the date of construction of the roof, um, with the slightly later felling representing minor repairs or modifications, or whether the roof incorporated reused timbers from an earlier structure. So again, this is where the different strands of evidence um, from the early Dunster team are going to be key to understanding the building. So have we got two dates because they're reusing part of an earlier roof, or have we got an earlier roof that's been altered later? And then um, moving just across Church Street, four, six and eight Church Street roof. Um, again, an extended sampling programme has allowed more timbers to be dated, both from the new sampling and also from the previous sampling. 
Again, this is demonstrated that the timbers of this route represent more than one felling event, so more than one phase. The two identifiable phases are potentially several decades apart, one from the early 15th century and one from the later 15th century. In this instance, the majority of the dated timbers are from the late 15th century felling, and hence it could be suggested on the Denja evidence that this later felling may be when the reef structure was actually constructed, but that it incorporated some earlier timber. However, again, this needs to be re-looked at in the light of the structural evidence from the early Dunster team. <coughs> 11 Westgate. Um, additional sampling this reef only served to date a few more timbers, but again, this strengthens the likelihood of these dated timbers being representative of the reef structure, indicating a constructed date at some point in the 1370s to 1390s. and 17 Westgate Street. Um, this is one of the most frustrating buildings from a dendrochronological perspective, as with 16 timbers now sampled, it's only possible to date four of them. These four timbers could represent a single felling event, single phase, in the mid 14th century. This building serves to emphasize the continuing poor overall success rate with respect to data to the dating of apparently suitable timbers and samples from buildings in Dunster. Whilst we've now managed to increase the success rate from about 33% of samples taken to just under 50% um, of the 220 samples now taken, this is clearly still significantly below the success rate we, ex we would expect. So what are the problems? The top image here shows a sample with too few rings for secure dating purposes. There have been a number of buildings assessed in which areas of interest to the early Dunster project team contain timbers with too few rings and no sampling could therefore be undertaken. The middle image shows a sample that has plenty of rings for secure dating purposes and with a normal growth pattern. So I hope you can see the, the extreme difference between the, essentially the number of lines that you can pick out in this versus from the top one um, and the middle one. Um, the lower image shows a sample that has plenty of rings, um, but it's been affected by the way that the tree itself has been managed. Um, so things like pollarding um, or environmental issues like flooding um, have adversely affected the growth of the tree, resulting in bands of very narrow growth rings. Um, so I hope you can see that sort of in the middle and at the ends, um, you've got sort of the more typical growth rings, and then you've got these little areas where they're all much tighter together. So obviously something has happened to the tree. Um, <coughs> This growth anomaly means the Turing series does not reflect the general climatic signal that is the key to securing dating. Short ring width series, generally those from timbers derived from young trees, um, then, then they, don't, they simply don't provide enough data to demonstrate where they fit in these sort of massive master chronologies that Cathy was talking about. It's a bit like having a partial fingerprint because it's only partial, it could actually belong to several people. So when they're trying to compare those, those ring widths with the sort of master chronology, it, could, it fits in too many places, there's too many corresponding. Um, the size of timber doesn't necessarily reflect the, the number of growth rings present. A large timber could be derived from either a large slow grown tree, which would have plenty of rings, or a large fast grown trim, tree which would have too few growth rings so it's not until you actually look at the ring widths themselves that you can tell whether it's going to have sufficient um, information. These growth anom anomalies are shown um, here for a number of measured ring width series present presented graphically. Years are along the x-axis and ring width in millimetres on the y-axis. Uh, <laughs> I will take Kathy's word for it. Um, uh, the top series is a normal, likely datable ring width series. So that's the, the, the first line, which has got this lovely long um, wiggly line. I presume that makes it, means it's good. Um, the other five ring width series have growth suppression events marked by arrows. So I think 
This is where Cathy was talking about if you get things like pollarding, so it's been part of managed woodland, or things like flooding, then it creates this very kind of uneven pattern, um, which is very difficult to date. Um, so none of these five ringwit series are likely to contain sufficient general signal for secure dating purposes. One of the other problems is elm. During the assessment of dendropotential undertaken before sampling of elements of buildings flagged up as of interest by the early Dunster team, it became apparent that elm was quite used quite regularly in buildings in Dunster. This isn't unusual in some parts of the country and certainly isn't unusual in Somerset. The elm timbers have similar issues as the young trees and growth anomalies and as far as elm is concerned, this appears to be far more prevalent. Um, so wherever elm timbers are found, um, as can be seen from these images of elm symbols from a site in Oxfordshire. Um, so I think it's just we've got these, these inconsistencies where you get these very narrow rings and then the broader rings which just make them impossible to date. A recent research investigation commissioned by Historic England demonstrated that the dating of elm samples by ring width dendrochronology is highly problematic, and those sites where elm can be successfully dated are few and far between. Hence, unfortunately, any areas of interest comprising only elm timbers were rejected, such as the roof of Four Mill Lane. Um, but I think it's probably worth saying that um, quite often elm is used in conjunction with oak, so, you know, sometimes you do get, you know, even as part of restructures that have got some elm in them, you can still have a go at dating. But obviously, if it's all elm, then you're, you're, you're going to struggle. Um, so, Dunster buildings, in spite of over 220 oak samples having been taken, remain a challenge with respect to successful dating, but at least the success rate has improved. Whilst this may remain frustrating from a purely dating perspective, um, the, many, the problems encountered combined with potentially regular use of oak timbers and the relatively common presence of elm, bearing in mind that oak is by far the preferred timber for structural elements, are providing insights into the timber resources available to the people of Dunster during the medieval and post-medieval periods. As well as the more obvious dating evidence, the Denjo is, providing to help and is provo provide, proving to help understand the historic buildings of Dunster and the development of the settlement. So it's these questions around, you know, well, if they're using elm, where are they getting elm from? Where's the timber coming in from? More technical stuff. Radiocarbon wiggle matching and oxygen isotope analysis do provide us with additional options for scientific dating where Dendro has been unsuccessful. So we may yet date a few more of the already sampled timbers from Dunster. And once we have finalised the Dendro results, we'll review the, with Mary's team the key samples that remain undated. And these will be assessed and, if appropriate, will be submitted for these complementary scientific dating techniques. Um, a Historic England research report will be produced for each individual building analysed dendrochronologically as part of the Early Dunster project. These will be provided to the team and to the owners and tenants of the buildings, but will also be available on the Historic England website um, on the link given below, so they'll be freely available. And then finally, thanks are due to Robert Howard and Alison Arnold of the Nottingham Tree Ring Dating Laboratory for undertaking the Dendro programme for the Early Dunster Project, funded by Historic England, and also to Andy Moyer, who undertook the Dendro programme for the Unearthing Dunster Project. And thanks also to every single member of the Early Dunster Project team and all of the owners and tenants who allowed access to the properties. Without the enthusiasm and interest, the project would not have happened. I was just, sorry, I was just going to say that I can't promise to answer any questions on Dendro, but please do come and ask if you've got them, because you never know. I might be able to, um, you know, sort of dredge information out of my head. So, yeah, don't feel that you can't ask me just because I was reading Cathy's paper. So. Well done, Rebecca. That was quite, quite... A tour de force, actually. You sounded as though you knew all about it. It was brilliant. Well done.